Hebrews. I'm not calling you that. I'm telling you to turn there. Hebrews. Uh, you know, when you start making jokes about people sleeping, that's the easiest one in the world for people to offer rebuttals on, isn't it? You know, real pastors, you had to put a spell. I see you guys drive, so it's not like I put you to sleep. I saw you come in the parking lot that way. So, Hebrews. Hebrews. And uh, tonight, we'll be in chapter 1. So if you don't know where Hebrews is, it's not very far before Revelation. So Hebrews, first, uh, James, 1st, 2nd, Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John, and then Jude, and Revelation. So toward the end of your Bible, you'll be in Hebrews. <clears throat> we're going to read chapter 1 this evening, and we're going to see that Jesus Christ is better than the angels. He's above the angels. He's superior to the angels. And, uh, you know, it's good for us as believers to remember Jesus. Thank you, Andrew, for that song, What Will You Do With Jesus? It's incredible, actually, thinking that we stand in judgment of Him. Your chance to judge Jesus is a very limited one. Very, very limited in its scope and its ability. What you judge is whether or not you'll receive Him. The rest of it's all up to Him. And so... That's an interesting perspective on that. Chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake or in the in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth the garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So, Father, I pray that you would help us this this uh, evening as we look at Jesus Christ and who He is. And as we see Him, the God of creation, who has the scepter in His hand, the scepter symbolizing authority and power, who is the judge, who is God the Creator. God, I pray that this evening that You would help us to see the importance of remembering who Jesus is. And in a practical way, applying it to our lives, we pray for His sake. Amen. Well, here we are in, in uh, this letter, which is unique. I, the the uh, title in my Bible reads, The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. And does anybody else have an, a, the, the Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews in their Bibles? Everybody's Bible say that? Most of us Bibles say that. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, and I, I don't think it's, it's terribly important. Uh, I don't know who wrote Hebrews. And you don't know who wrote Hebrews either. Uh, but... I think that it's quite likely that Paul the Apostle wrote Hebrews. Uh, it's, it's very, very likely. Here's what I found as I've studied trying to figure out who wrote Hebrews. And I put some time into it and looked at a lot of different possibilities. When I read uh, the letter to the Hebrews and I read some of the language and I read some of the people uh, that are mentioned in the closing uh, commentary, the closing notes of the letter, I see people that Paul knew and that he would have addressed and I see them addressed in the way that he would have addressed them. Normally, Paul gave, signed a letter. Normally, he would say, I, Paul, you know, I've signed it with my own hand, or he would indicate that an amanuensis had written it. Normally, when Paul would write a letter, he would start off with Paul the Apostle 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he would he would uh, let himself uh, be known as the author to the letter of Hebrews. The church always believed. The churches in history historically has pretty much believed that Paul wrote the epistle to the Hebrews, and that's what lends to me the notion that Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, individuals that have uh, studied the languages a lot find in Hebrews several expressions that are unique and uh, that uh, aren't used by the Apostle Paul. They find some grammatical structures that are unique and that aren't things that Paul had written. But let me just ask you a question. Is it impossible for Paul to, uh, in the limited scope that we know of his writing, to use words or uh, grammatical structures that he had not used at other times? Yes, sir. It's certainly possible for him to do that. So those are arguments. And what I find is when I read one argument, I, I tend to think, well, that's pretty good. That's pretty well laid out. And I tend to believe it. And then when I read another one, it says, well, you know, here's why we think Paul didn't write Hebrews. And I look at all the reasons for it, and I think, well, maybe Paul didn't write Hebrews. But here's the deal, folks. It's actually an important question to ask. In other words, you could say, Pastor, why does it matter if Paul wrote Hebrews or didn't? Well, that's the very point. I believe that the nature of the letter, the material in it, it uh, begs or it requires the laying aside of human personality and really exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see as we study Hebrews that Jesus Christ is better than the angels. He's better than the Levitical priest system. He's better than, than Aaron the high priest. He is better uh, than the sacrifices. He is better. We're going to see that Jesus is better than everything. And in order for Christ to have preeminence, just like John the Baptist said when he was in prison, his ministry was over, and he was ready in that decreasing part. John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. One of the best ways for Jesus Christ to be exalted is for anyone who could be looked up to or admired, or even be a distraction to just be taken out of the way. Mm -hmm. See, as we read the letter to Hebrews, we don't have to debate whether or not Paul was a legitimate apostle. We don't even know for sure that he wrote the letter. See, you say, Pastor, I know for sure. No, you believe for sure that Paul wrote the letter. But the truth of the matter is that Hebrews doesn't tell us who wrote it. And so you don't know. Uh, when we get to heaven, maybe you'll be right or maybe you'll be surprised. But the deal is, is that it's kind of a little bit tragic, isn't it, that a lot of the study and effort that's put into studying Hebrews is about Paul. When Paul's not mentioned in it on purpose. You hear me tonight? In other words, I don't know how many people want to debate with me about whether or not Paul wrote Hebrews. I want to talk about what's in Hebrews. You get it? Yep. In other words, Paul evidently didn't need to be mentioned if he wrote it. He evidently didn't want to be acknowledged if he wrote it. So give up on Paul, would you? Just let him go. Let Paul go on this one. He doesn't want to be involved. If, if the Holy Spirit used Paul to write Hebrews, friend, Paul didn't want you to know. So don't try and know. Okay? And if someone wrote Hebrews and uh, imitated Paul, uh, don't give them the credit for it. Uh, not really. It's not, a, it's not apocryphal. It's not pseudepigraphal or apocrypha. This is the Scripture. It's the Word of God. So here is the way that we're going to look at the letter to the Hebrews. This is a letter that evidently was given by the Holy Spirit of God, in which Jesus Christ is given to us or presented to us as our high priest as superior in every way to any religion, to any belief, to anything that a person could go back to. Now, we talked about the authorship of Hebrews, and uh, our conclusion is that the Holy Spirit wrote Hebrews. Can we all agree with that this evening? Amen. You say, Pastor, I've got some really good Paul arguments. Well, I would just be delighted to hear them. I've probably never heard them before, you know? So please, uh, bring it. Uh, I'd love to hear what you think. Actually, I'd love to just listen to you because I like you, and that's about the way it goes. Uh, the reality of it is, is that you won't convince me that Paul did or didn't write Hebrews because I, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants Jesus Christ to have all of the attention in this letter. And if you go down that road again, if you go down that road, then you've gone down the wrong path. Okay? So the audience to the Hebrews. This letter was written, uh, we think, about probably two years before Jerusalem was ransacked in 70 AD. And when Jerusalem was sacked in, in 70 AD, it wasn't like, you know, the city was looted and raided. No, literally it was destroyed to the place that it was just rubble 
and all of the Jews were required to leave. Jerusalem became non-Jewish in 70 AD. You know, this whole debate that is contemporary to our lifetimes about whether or not the Jews have a right to the land, the, the, you know, the Zionist movement and so forth, well, uh, they were taken out of the land. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get into that debate. It really is not an important debate today. We know that that is the place where the Holy Spirit, where Jesus Christ is going to set up his millennial reign. And we know that Jerusalem has future significance. But the fact is, is that the, things were very, very rough. Do, does a city just get ransacked and the people removed from it? Does that normally just happen by surprise? No, the things that were fomenting at the time that this letter was written had been fomenting at the time of Jesus Christ. The uprising of the Jews and several uh, uprisings that had been uh, squashed and put down had happened a number of times. And so it, it, for, for helpful reading, you could read some intertestamental history. You could read uh, some of the Apocrypha and give you a little bit of an idea of some of the political events that are going on. Those are just historical books. And to give you some ideas of the political events that were going on in Jerusalem. But the author of the, of the Hebrews, especially in the last warning passage, indicates to the Hebrews, the Hebrew believers, that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Now here's the scenario, here's what's happening. Persecution has come to a head. Persecution has come to its fullness. It was a while in the early church before the first martyr. It was a while before the people that killed Jesus had the audacity to kill a disciple of Jesus. And the logic behind it was simply, uh, you know, Gamaliel, he put it pretty well. Do you remember when Peter and John were brought before him in the council, the same council that killed Jesus? And uh, he talked about, you know, uh, Thutis, you know, had an uprising, and a man named Judas had had an uprising, and they'd been put down, and the movement had gone away. But his advice to the council was, hey, let's let them alone, because if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest haply, by happenstance, you be found even to fight against God. And that was kind of the attitude at Jerusalem after the crucifixion. You may not like Jesus, but when they killed him, he came back from the dead, so don't try that anymore. That's not, that isn't the way to eliminate this belief. When you kill somebody and they come back from the dead, it just ruins everything. And so there was quite a while before James, the uh, brother John was killed, or James was killed with the sword, and Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned. And uh, then after that, then you have the Apostle Paul uh, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And things got worse from there forward. If you pay attention in the, uh, in the epistles, in the letters to the churches, like the church at Corinth and Thessalonica, you'll see oftentimes references to the fact that the saints around the world were taking up collections and sending money back to Jerusalem to support the saints which were enduring terrible persecution. If you are a believing Jew, and I believe if you calculate an Acts, I'm sorry I'm giving you so much just background material, but I want us to understand the background of Hebrews. If you are a believing Jew, and I believe that if you go through Acts, and you just add up the multitudes and the 5,000 and 3,000 and several thousand each time, and you look at a population of a city of 100,000, you'll see that Jerusalem was easily probably 50% believers. That's a lot. Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church is probably 50% believers. But it's interesting how much ability uh, that godless or unbelievers have to make things miserable on the believers. You know, believers, we oftentimes, we're very passive about what we believe, and I believe it's the right approach to do this. We shouldn't be nasty. If we're going to have a disagreement, we're not going to wrong somebody. We're going to suffer a wrong. That's, a, that's the uh, way a believer is. So if you're a business person and you get saved and you're in partnership with some people, and they say, well, you know what? It's my business, and I don't want to be a part of a business with somebody that's a follower of Jesus. And I'm taking the business, and I'm leaving. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to fight them, or they're going to take it. If you're a family member, and you have mom and dad, and they're Jewish, they're, they're, uh, they're not believers, and you trust Jesus as your Savior, and you got <laughs> baptized public in Jerusalem, when you came home, your parents said, I don't have a son anymore. I don't have a daughter anymore, and you don't have a home. Get out. And so Jerusalem, the Hebrew Christians, 
were, out of all the believers, suffering a great deal more. It was much easier to be a Gentile believer in the first century than it was to be a Jewish believer. Jews were hated because of their ethnicity. They were hated because of the blessing that God pronounced on Isaac versus Ishmael. And uh, God's people, the Jews, uh, are always a blessing in every nation and in every age, but the reality of it is they're always hated. There is always anti-Semitism. There will always be anti-Semitism until the final judgment. And so not only are you hate it because you're Jewish, but now your family hates you. Think on that. Think on being disliked because of your ethnicity, and now your family hates you. I don't think he would mind my sharing this. As a matter of fact, I'm sure he would. But Joe Kaufman, the uh, Republican uh, that ran for Congress against Debbie Wasserman Schultz in, in our county, uh, he is Jewish. He uh, grew up knowing he was Jewish, but never really, was really a practicing Jew. And when he was in college, he had a roommate that he thought was his best friend. And he came in one day, and there was, I, I believe this story is right, there was a swastika on the wall in his room. And he's kind of like, what's that? And his roommate was just kind of like, yeah. You know? And then, I can't remember, but I think he said something about somebody on, on a nice uh, uh, coat that he had, painted a swastika on the back of his coat. And you know what it ended up doing? ended up driving him to acknowledge that he's Jewish. You know, and being, you know, I am Jewish. You know, God made me Jewish. And if people hate me for it, there's nothing I can do about it. I haven't done anything wrong. And so he embraced his Judaism as a result of it. Well, now, if that's the situation you're in because of your ethnicity and then you get saved, who are you going to embrace? That's a, bad, that's, a, that's a tough scenario, isn't it? Listen to me, it is not unheard of. It is so common today when Catholics, when Mormons, when Muslims, when Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, when Jews receive Jesus, literally they're ostracized by their family, their friends, and it's hard. You think it doesn't matter? Think people don't have feelings? Oh, well, you know, Jesus is all I need. Sure, he's all you need, but it's tough. And so the Gentile believers were really a blessing to the Jews. And we know that, the, that Achaia and Macedonia were exemplary in being poor individuals that would send their bounty back to support their brethren at Jerusalem. And so this church is really a wonderful thing. In spite of all of that, though, what we see in this letter to the Hebrews had happened would be individuals that are asking the question, is it worth it to follow Jesus? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Now, not in every scenario, not in any case, and I think oftentimes uh, it's, it's really inaccurate to do so, but sometimes following Jesus means really taking up a cross. It means really suffering persecution. It really means a loss. Uh, a, a guy that I didn't have the privilege of meeting, but that influenced a pastor friend of mine, I used to tell my pastor, he said, you know, before I was saved, he said, you know, I was a millionaire. I had this and this and this. He said, now that I'm saved, he says, I'm saved. But because of the nature of his businesses, when he was born again, he lost everything when he was born again. And, uh, but he didn't lose anything. It was all worth it to him. Sometimes believers will lose their house. They'll lose their job. They'll lose a lot of things to follow the Lord Jesus. And you know something in the flesh, sometimes we're not willing to do that. Now here's what I found. Let me just share something with you. I found that you don't ever lose anything for Jesus. That's just what I believe. And I know it's true. You know, sometimes what it is is that you have to let go of something so that you can have God's best in your life. You know, I found out that many people, they don't inherit things. Things inherit them. It would be better for some of us to be disinherited and be free to serve God rather than have to take care of our inheritance. Does that make sense? In other words, okay, let me, let me just put it this way. I don't know if I'll ever have an inheritance, but if I do, it'll be in Kansas. What good will that do Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church? <laughs> See, that'd be a problem, wouldn't it? If I have to go home and take care of the inheritance, that'd be a problem for Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, wouldn't it? It'd be better off without it. It'd be better off with nothing. You know, I'd be better off having an eternal inheritance. And that's just true for many of us as believers. And sometimes what you have, and what sometimes it seems like God is allowed to be taken away, God says, no, I've got something better for you. That's why Jesus told the disciples 
when he was giving them the orientation for discipleship in Matthew 6, he said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth, I mean on earth, <laughs> where on earth where moth and rust stuff corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves cannot break through nor steal. And then he said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, sometimes sometimes we treasure lost relationships. That is, relationships with individuals that blaspheme or are unwilling to receive Jesus. Sometimes we treasure that relationship more than we do our relationship with our Savior. And you know, in that situation, my friend, you ought to love the lost, just like Jesus does. But when you love a lost person more than you love Jesus, that's a wrong perspective, isn't it? It's just Jesus first. And so the Hebrew believers are, they are in, they're facing impending destruction, and they're wanting to band together with their lost Jewish brethren. But in order to band together with their lost Jewish brethren, they're having to at least be silent about their belief, their faith in Jesus Christ. At the very minimum, they're having to be silent. And uh, by the way, if you're Jewish, and, and uh, many folks are, many folks in the church are Jewish as far as their background goes, and if you're Jewish, let me, uh, or Catholic, or whatever religion you came from, let me warn you about going back. You know, if you come from a Catholic family and there's a wedding in your family, they'll want you to take communion, won't they? And uh, let the priest put, don't do it. Sit silently, stand silently, but don't participate in that paganism. Don't participate in it. Uh, if you're Jewish, they'll want you to participate. I, I, listen, I don't want to offend anybody this evening, but don't participate in a Passover that doesn't acknowledge that the Passover lamb has come. Don't participate in it. I know a lot of people, oh, the Passover, we love it. It's our history. And I, no, my friend, don't go with people that don't acknowledge that the Passover lamb has come. And uh, celebrate that the past celebrate something so meaningless. The testimony of it is so dangerous. You understand that? In other words, you say, "Well, Pastor, what if I offend my family?" Well, what do you think Jesus thinks about the fact that he sacrificed, he he gave his life, he shed his blood, and they say, "Doesn't matter. We don't want it." Where's the true offense here? I had rather offend a person than offend my Savior. And so, be wise about these things. Okay, so now the letter to the Hebrews is written, if you're writing a purpose statement or trying to understand it this evening then, the letter to the Hebrews is written, written to Hebrew believers at Jerusalem, urging them not to go away from serving or following Jesus. The letter is written saying, don't stop following Jesus. Don't go back away from the faith. That's why we are familiar with Hebrews 10.25, which says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. That is, Hebrew believers had stopped meeting and assembling in the church with other believers. They, they'd left the church. And uh, because of the persecution and because of consequences for being Christian, they said, just too much. And so they had forsaken the believers. And you know, I'll tell you something. There's nothing like people who share something in common being left by those with whom they share it, standing alone. <clears throat> you ever thought, you know what? I'm not the only person that should be carrying this load. I'm not the only person that should be going through this. I'm not the only one, but it sure feels like it. It sure seems like it. And so, to put it politely, the letter to the Hebrews is written to cowards. It's written to people who lack courage. And it is a letter which convinces them that Jesus Christ is worthy. He's worthy to be followed. He's worthy to be lived for. Christian, could we make it our goal to be convinced by this letter that Jesus is worthy? Jesus is worthy of any shame that you'll bear, any reproach that you'll suffer. Jesus is worthy of any sacrifice that you'll make. Jesus is worthy of anything that you'll lose. Whether it be relationships, whether it be possessions, Jesus Christ is worthy. And so we're going to be introduced to Him in verse 2. And as uh, a matter of fact, we're not going to go as far this evening as I had originally intended, which is pretty normal, I think, isn't it? Uh, they, we we're told in verse 2 that Jesus, is just like we've seen in John, by the, isn't this beautiful, the parallels in chapter 1 of Hebrews to the parallels in chapter 1 of John? Maybe John wrote Hebrews. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> that's just to poke you if you're a Pauline 
Hebrew author. Is something wrong? Okay. Okay. He's not sleeping. He's just not sitting up straight. All right, verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So who's Jesus? He's the creator. He's the heir of all things, and he's made the world. Is Jesus worthy of our worship? Amen. Is there anyone more worthy? No. Is Jesus worthy to suffer for? Mm -hmm. Was anyone more worthy? See, so He is the Creator of all things, and God has spoken to us by His Son. Now, it is a marvelous thing when God sends a prophet with a sign. You know, Elijah was that preeminent prophet, wasn't he? He prayed that it would not rain on the earth, and it didn't rain by the, by, what is it, the space of three years and three months. didn't rain. And then Elijah prayed, and it rained. Elijah called down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice after it had been drenched in water, after there had been a trench made around it, and he called down fire from heaven, and fire dropped from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Was it Elijah or Elisha? I always mix the two up. When the band of 50 came and said, you know, this, the king sent for them, and he said, oh man of God, he said, if I'm a man of God, let fire fall from heaven, and you be consumed. What was it? That was Elisha, wasn't Elijah. it? Yeah, because it was Gehazi, his servant. Yeah, okay. But it was Elisha. But anyway, uh, God used prophets to speak. And when God used a prophet to speak, normally He <clears throat> sent a prophet and He sent them in power so that they could, have, they could uh, bring forth signs. Now, a prophet would prove that he was sent by God. He would validate his message two ways. He would validate his message either by a sign or a wonder. He would do something that was humanly impossible to show that God is with me. I'm speaking for God. Or he would predict something that would be impossible to know in order to show that God is with me. And the, the onus of, uh, of uh, um, legitimacy on a prophet was that if what he said didn't come to pass, he'd be put to death. So God used to speak through the prophets. And by the way, how well were the prophets received by Israel? <laughs> Not well. You know, that's why oftentimes Jesus would say, There's sh you know, a, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh the sign, there shall no sign be given it. Why? Because they had signs. Signs don't make you believe. Your heart determines whether or not you believe. Do you hear me tonight? Your heart determines whether or not you believe. You, you can refuse to believe anything even though you acknowledge the facts. It say, give us a sign. What sign? And what sign are you going to give? And they give a sign. The sign will come to pass. And they say, well, you know, forget it. Remember Pharaoh? Now, he wasn't Jewish, obviously. But, uh, you know, he had plenty of signs, didn't he? Pharaoh's issue was not that he did not know whether or not God was God. Pharaoh's issue was that he was not willing to bow to God. He wasn't willing to submit to God. And so here we see that God had in the times past spoken to their fathers by the prophets. And here Paul is saying, your fathers had the prophets. And the prophets were marvelous messengers. And then it says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his sons. Now can you imagine if you could resurrect the dead... Here, and the, pro the fathers could say, I saw Elijah. These individuals could say, I saw the Son of God. Right away we're seeing that Jesus Christ and what we have by Jesus is superior. Do you ever wish that you could have been part of the theocracy of Israel? Would it be interesting to be there in those great battles when David was the great king of Israel? I'm a bit of a uh, warrior personality. I'm not saying I'm a tough guy or anything like that. I'm just saying I always admire courage. I admire warriors. And I would have loved to have been, uh, to have known David and his mighty men. I just, you know, to be a fugitive in the rocks, if you're not married, David was married, <laughs> but it, it, to be a fugitive hiding in the caves of En Gedi mm -hmm. with David, knowing the future of what God had for Israel, and following a guy like David that was so courageous that he wasn't afraid of Saul. He just didn't want to kill Saul. I mean, most of David's life, he could have at any time put himself in the place that he knew God had anointed him to be, and that's king of Israel, but he didn't. And you know, I wouldn't mind being there, be part of that theocracy. Can you imagine seeing the glory of Solomon the way that the queen from, uh, was it, is it, we call, is it Queen of Sheba? Sheba. Uh, the Queen of Sheba, uh, the queen from Ethiopia that came, and, and she said, I heard all these things, and I thought they're all exaggerations, but no, actually, uh, 
the, the, the reign of King Solomon and the way that God has blessed him is so much beyond what could be described or imagined. We need to be there. But my friend, you could talk to a person that was part of Solomon's reign and they could tell you all about everything they'd seen. You could talk to someone who had been with David, maybe one of his mighty men, and you could say, yeah, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. Right away, the Holy Spirit is not pulling punches. Right away, the Holy Spirit of God tells us we have an inferior message. We live in an inferior time to anything or anyone that ever has been before. Hear me now, friend. The church age is the greatest age that has ever been. The church age is the greatest age that has ever been. This is the age of the Holy Spirit of God. This is the age when the Spirit of God is in the world. Hear me. The Holy Spirit of God is in the world convincing men. Convicting sin. You say, Pastor, this is a wicked world. I don't see the Holy Spirit of God. My friend, you and I will be witnesses the day God takes His Spirit out of this world and you'll see what it'd be like. Mm -hmm. You'll see what it's like. We're in the age of the Holy Spirit. And it's a great age. We're in the age when the Spirit of God not only is our comforter, but He is Christ in us. When Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I, the Holy Spirit, uh, He said, I will send you another comforter. That another comforter, you know, a lot of times we, we don't hear that yes, another of the same kind. No, Jesus is saying, I'm going to send myself. And the difference would be that while, you could, while Jesus was on earth, you could follow Him. And as long as you were where He was at, you were always in His presence. But today, to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior is to have His presence in you so that He'll never leave you. You're never comfortless. In other words, friend, you have never since the moment of your salvation been in a place where you could say, there's nobody here and God has forsaken me. Mm -hmm. No. You're always in a situation where you literally can simply say, Jesus, Jesus, what do I do? You know, can you imagine the disciples being sent out by twos? And the power that was given to them. And so that would be an exciting time and age. But if I were them, I'd be excited to get back to be with Jesus. I just feel a little bit unsafe. You're never alone. I love that song. No, never alone. That's what it's talking about. We live in the age of the Holy Spirit. And friend, God in times past spake unto us by His prophets. But He hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Now, in the next several weeks, we're going to see everything that Jesus is. Want to see one last thing about Jesus? And not only uh, is, is He superior to the prophets as we begin to see here, and we're going to see that He's, he's superior uh, to the angels as well. But I want to read verses 10, uh, 10 and 11 because uh, I want us to see that Jesus Christ is eternal God. And Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. You see that? And the heavens are the work of thine hands. Again, we saw this in the Gospel of John a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? That Jesus Christ was the part of the Godhead that was responsible for the physical creation of the world. In verse 11, we see about the world. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Now, friend, is Jesus Christ superior to anything else on earth? Is he superior to any other time that men have lived? And the answer to that is yes. And I look forward to getting in the next several weeks and looking at the things specific to the Hebrew Christians and seeing why it is that they're urged not to go back from following Jesus. And you know, we need some urging sometimes too. Maybe you haven't stopped following Jesus, but maybe you've lost the urgency. Maybe you haven't gone back, so to speak, but you're not going forward. And one of the things that we need is to see the Jesus that the Holy Spirit paints to these believers who have tasted of the heavenly gift, who have tasted, and they know what it is to have God in them. And you know what? We need a taste, don't we? Let's have a taste of Jesus in the next several weeks as we study in Hebrews. God, please help us to retain the things that we've heard this evening. And I pray that you'd whet our appetite to know more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for paying attention this evening. You are our wonderful audience. Uh, I'm going to take some prayer requests tonight. I'll mention a couple of them.